Hi, everyone. This is John Pachetti along with my colleague, Scott Emig, and welcome to We Will Get Through This, Transformative Leadership for Disruptive Times, episode number 26, Scott, and it seems like we might be going back to the future a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right, John. We're starting to see some, um, you know, this this whole podcast started as we, we kind of entered the coronavirus phase one, and I think for a lot of places, they're there's no end in sight to phase one. And for a lot of places around the world, there's a sense that we're entering phase two. And you're yeah, right. Well, one of our wonderful students, uh, Mustafa in Melbourne, who's completing our master's in leadership program said, why don't we do an episode that helped people who are going back into lockdown there. And they may still have schools for some of their kids. It's unclear because they're still figuring it out. But 5 million residents of Melbourne, Australia now are sort of locked down for six weeks. Mm -hmm. Some of the South American countries are just now really getting into realizing they might not have school as they've known it. South, South Africa and all of Sub-Saharan Africa and the U.S., um, a very tricky time where the start of the school year is in jeopardy, actually, right? It's completely right. I think we have, um, we have students and we have relatives all over the world, and we're, we're hearing very different things from everybody. Um, and I, th I think one of the things that we're, we're hearing from everybody is this... Um, the sense of a bit of anxiety, you know, this, this idea that, um, you know, when this all began, um, because it was new, um, we were embracing the, we were embracing all the changes that it meant, you know, we were quickly ramping up our moves home and our transitioning from, from school, you know, face to face to online and all of our listeners out there, you know, they, they went through that. And now the question is, you know, is this going to continue? And I think the hardest really hard. thing, the hardest thing for our school leaders who mostly we're talking to, but teachers and just general interested great citizens of planet Earth is how to maintain the psychological motivation to know that we will get through this. On the other side, we'll be back to a newer normal and what we're calling normal X. But but in the next several weeks or months, we may have fits and starts like this, which means it really hard and I know for some leadership teams to figure out how do I motivate myself myself for the next three or four months to be in this uncertain mode and I think we're going to have to help everyone find their psychological cognitive load to be able to say we can do it um, you know what we're going to be really resilient and as long as we keep each other healthy that's the main thing and then we'll build in school whatever and however we can do it yeah I, I, that's exactly it you know, I think one of the first things is we all have to accept that it's it's okay to be stressed. You know, it's it's kind of that's part of this new normal is stress and anxiety. So if that's if that's here, if it's sitting on our shoulder, we have to figure out how to deal with that. And you know, for a lot of people, um, that's diving back into routines. That's saying every morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to exercise. You know, or I'm going to come home from work and I'm going to go for a jog. Um, it's being mindful about how we're eating and what we're eating because it's too easy in this prolonged anxiety to, to start eating worse and worse and worse. Um, I, just, I just read a story about um, the police force in Bangladesh is, is learning yoga because of this, this, this anxiety, this worry, and they're trying to figure out what are ways that they can help large numbers of people who typically are under a lot of stress anyway. How can they help them with this next layer of, of stress? Yeah. I think that's the crucial part for any leadership team is to really understand that if we're not going to accomplish school for the next phase of this year, the way we hope to, mm -hmm. that we're going to have to turn this into an advantage and not worry that we're behind. I'm hearing too often that we've got kids behind and you know, the line is behind what now for our most vulnerable kids, those who really need the supports of their special needs teacher or who use school as their escape from a very complicated, difficult life. I don't want to minimize that because absolutely we've got to reach out to them in different ways. But for most young people who are in supportive environments and are going generally okay, we can't pile on pressure that somehow they're part of COVID generation instead of generation Z, they're mm -hmm. generation COVID. Um, mm -hmm. But so let's assume this will be different. Take the pressure off of this, March to cover the curriculum. Let's don't try to attempt to teach the same things in the same ways, because for those who are going back to school or are thinking go back to school, it's like, well, forget all that other stuff we were doing you know, in, 
in the, earlier in the year, um, don't wear that responsibility that you're to blame for having to do this in awkward ways. Take advantage of some of the tools and technologies that are actually helpful and kids are excited about. Um, take the chance to try something different that gets kids excited about their passions. And then some new skills will be developed that actually might be as good as what we would have done. And in some cases, maybe even better than what we've done in, you know, in sit and get kind of school. Exactly. I think, I think those are all wonderful points. You know, this, we don't need to label this group of children who are going through this, the, the COVID generation or the, the, those students with the asterisk next to them because they finished school with the, with the asterisk. Um, if anything, um, these, these students and all the educators out there, this is, you know, we've, we've been saying this all along. This is this powerful opportunity right now. This is, you know, it's, you, you highlighted the fact again that, you know, we don't need to be living this sit and get environment that we all know as educators has, has been detrimental to so many students. You know, this is the time to figure out why do we lose a lot of kids? Why do we lose a lot of kids out of high school anyway? You know, and, Maybe this is the time where we can, we can double down on those things that we know actually engage them. Yeah, and I think what we can do if this is people's second time around for doing it this way or just an extension as they move into the North American New Year for school mm -hmm. is we might do things that are really more in-depth than we even tried in the first part of the year, like regular old reading. There was mm -hmm. a time before television and you know, before all of the technology that allows us to do things with screens that people spent time in the evening reading. And the best way to improve literacy is reading. And if it's with young children, reading with them and to them and with them on our laps and enjoying telling mm -hmm. stories. Um, so it's okay to build in oral traditions and in written traditions of reading. It doesn't have to be an assessment task with a rubric and it's gonna be marked by next week or everybody's stressed out. Keeping mm -hmm. track of the books you're reading. So um, honoring flexibility in the way in which you give students choice to submit assignments to, so that they can do it with whatever they've got, as opposed to they're behind because of the situation they're in. But thriving in this ambiguity, one of the skill sets we've all had to master and continue to now to negotiate this interconnected world is all of the different messages that come to us every day, whether we're in a pandemic or not. Uh, my favorite of the future focus skills is around the notion of self-regulation that's taking charge of your own learning, at least in my words. And boy, that's a good one to be practicing. And, and for people weak at that, let's get better at that. And then really understanding, again, the appreciation of each other, the yeah. opportunity, and this notion of the common good. I was reading, the, uh, as you were about Bangladesh, I was reading yesterday about Sweden and their move to sort of be the experiment that uh, they were going to let sort of a herd percentage cap in and just assume that the people would do the right things. And just mm -hmm. in the last four months, as most of the rest of the world has been hunkering down, they've just lived and let lived. And in the end, their economy is as bad as most of Europe in terms of the deficits that's happened with the recession. Mm -hmm. And their death toll is four times per capita that of the United States right now. It's a smaller place, but if you do per capita, they've had four times the deaths. So they've mm -hmm. had needless deaths for all the sake of sort of this live and let live attitude. So I think for those of you tempted to say, why don't we just let everybody get it, they can get it. We've now learned in that one country, a, a very progressive, amazing place, that in fact, maybe that wasn't the right idea, that doing things for the common good might mean we have to sacrifice a little bit to be able to protect not only the vulnerable, but increasingly this thing is going after young people in their organs and potentially in their own a long-term health effects that we might not even understand yet. So that's just a few of the things that make, I'm not trying to put a lemonade out of lemon, but no. we don't want to have people worry about the things they can't change and really try to take advantage of this because what they're looking for from their leaders is confidence that we will get through this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we will get through this. And, and that's very true. And I think your, you know, your talk of the collective good, um, that's so important. And everybody who's out there listening, you know, they find themselves in a position where they can affect, they have great influence over either the teachers who work with them or for them. They have great influence over the families they serve and the children they serve. Um, this is, these are the individuals who are looking, looking to you for, they're looking for the positive word. They're looking for the support. And it's amazing what that does for yourself. I know, I know when I reach out to a colleague and I tell them what a, what a wonderful job they're doing right now, you know, really appreciate the way you're handling this. Um, 
you know, the feedback that, you know, it, frequently those interactions are really, really powerful because, you know, I get something out of that too. I walk away feeling, feeling, you know, empowered from that experience as well and feeling better about myself and more connected. And I think connections are so vitally important right now. So absolutely, it, it is the common good. I think it's what draw, drew you to teaching and myself as well is this notion of care, responsibility and love and the notion of empowering people to have great lives. And if we focus on that, this is a different way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know for most of our leaders, they've been in such um, a, a, in a storm of emotions trying to keep everybody together. But mm -hmm. that's why they're in those situations. They were chosen because of who they were as much or more than what they know. And taking that deep breath and going, we're not going to worry about six weeks from now. We're going to take care of what we need to do today. We're going to get our learning ready. And for some of you, you will start school in what is, is the, the uh, first semester in the, in the Northern Hemisphere and go right back home. And for others, you won't and you'll come to school and the same thing will happen. And in the Southern Hemisphere, whichever way the school year starts or finishes, there's going to be interruptions. Almost make that in your head reality and let's take today and what we can gain from it because children learn from how we respond in difficult situations and i think they're looking to people who are responding with that care and that love and with the conviction that we're going to be okay and also that we need to take care of those that aren't and that's part of our responsibility if we gain that humanness back out of this we might claim back our schooling which has moved into testing center kind of approaches in many places rather than learning centers and caring, hopeful, loving places um, that just feel like they're there for the people in them, not just for the accountability in them. So I'm excited for that, even though I know, because in my own self, I'm, I'm done with this. <laughs> but actually, I look at this as a challenge we've been handed that uh, we're going to meet. And it's, uh, that part's relatively exciting because people need us. We need each other. And if we can't do that, then we've lost the humanness of why we should have schools to begin with. Very much, very much. Well, so John, we usually leave these with a bit of a call to our audience about something to do. And have you thought of a have you thought of a challenge? Well, I know you probably have a really good one. I was going to come back to one we did back when our episodes were single digits. And there's a method we use in our teacher ed programs, and it's kind of gimmicky, but it's to catch uh, kids being good. Uh, and, and where you know my goal, because you can't get if you have a hundred students you're responsible for, you can't praise them every day. Um, all in the same way, but to find two or three examples and to make mm -hmm. sure you reach out, whether that's a phone call, that's a note, an email, to, or a text, in whatever form works for you, is to say, I really appreciate what you did today. It was fantastic. Or if it's a student work, to really contact the parent and say, your child's really switched on. I'm so impressed. It's great to have them in my class. And even if it's been in a Zoom lesson or in some makeshift situation because of your own conditions, the, the surprise of that, if you did three, five days a week, 15, over the course of a month, you'd find every one of your students or one, every one of your staff, and they would be honored, and it's not too overwhelming. We can find that time to thank three. I love that. I think that's a, that's a wonderful challenge. John, I, I appreciate the fact that we, uh, for you and me, I appreciate the fact that we've been doing this all along as this, been, this has been going, particularly as we, again, you know, may not see an end in sight. It's nice to, nice to have this connection. Absolutely. And we have such amazing listeners all around the world who have gotten in touch through the various ways in which they're listening or watching. And I know for many of you, these are words you're hearing and you're going to turn them into actions. But we have the deepest admiration for the leaders, the teachers, the educators, the families that are going through this together because this is not easy. And we know that we're just trying to stay well through this process. But if we can enjoy this moment and appreciate the opportunity to help young people have great lives, what a pleasure that is. And if we stop to remind ourselves of this, if a pandemic took us to do that, at least we'll get something out of it. Well, it was good to see you. And it's always nice to have our listeners with us. We do appreciate tremendously all the good work you're doing out there. Thanks so much, Scott. This has been episode 26 of We Will Get Through This. We look forward to seeing or or having you listen to us next time. On behalf of Scott, have a great rest of the week, and we look forward to talking with you down the road. Bye-bye.